Well, now we're going to talk this evening about the long-awaited millennium. And this is a very complex issue. In the previous lecture, where we dealt with the coming of Christ, we saw that when Christ comes again, He does not touch the ground, and He stays in the air, and the elect are gathered and meet Him in the air. There are, of course, other verses in the Bible where Christ comes down and touches the Mount of Olives, for example, and we'll have to deal with that as well. Now, this long-awaited millennium is a very important issue in the time that we are living in. And there are various doctrines. The one is amillennianism, and that teaches there is no specific period of a thousand year reign. The period applies to the whole of church history, and this is the view that is held by Roman Catholicism and some conservative Protestant groups. They hold to amillennianism. There is no thousand-year period, and the church reigns. Then there is post-millennianism. This view claims that the kingdom is a present reality because Christ reigns in his church. All nations will be converted to Christ prior to the coming of Christ. The period prior to his coming will become peaceful, and the gospel will be spread to all nations, both the Lutheran Augsburg Confession and the Puritan Westminster Confession subscribe to this view. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. The Bible doesn't teach that everybody is going to become peaceful and the gospel will spread to all nations. The Bible says when they say, peace, peace, what comes then? Sudden destruction. So neither amillennianism nor postmillennianism is the biblical view. Then we have premillennianism, and you have dispensational premillennianism, which teaches a secret rapture prior to the tribulation. And that we have seen is not biblical either. The millennium kingdom reaches its fulfillment in the Jewish nation. That's what they teach. But the Jewish nation, according to the Bible, that the time of the Jews will come to an end after the 70 weeks, and then the gospel would go to the Gentiles. A Jew can act, become part of the kingdom today by accepting Jesus Christ as his personal saviour. The Jewish nation, the temple, the sacrificial system are restored in Palestine, they teach. Well, if you restore the sacrificial system, what are you saying? You're saying that Jesus died for naught because the sacrificial system was a symbol, a type, of the death of Christ. You're going to crucify him all over again in a new sacrificial system that was done away with when Christ died. That's why the curtain tore from top to bottom. Isn't that right? Showing that God ended the sacrificial system. All warnings given to the church regarding the time of trouble prior to the coming of Christ now become applicable to the Jews only. As do Matthew 24 and, Matthew, and Luke 21 and all the teachings regarding the kingdom. That makes no sense whatsoever. I thought the kingdom is the blessed hope of those who are waiting for the return of the Lord. Then you have historic premillennialism, the redeemed of all ages on the earth during the millennium. The church is the Israel of God, comprising all the peoples of God. The millennial period constitutes the first thousand years of God's kingdom on earth. Is that biblical? No, because the Bible says clearly when the Lord comes, what happens to people? They die. And how many did Jeremiah see? There were no man, nothing. So those are the main teachings in the world, and none of them are biblical. None of them, not one. The end of the world, so what will it be like? Getting ready for the millennium? There was so much hype at the turn of the century. Isaiah chapter 14, 13 and 14, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will be like the Most High. Satan wanted to be like God. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, And thou, how art thou fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, that it's lay low the nations, 
and thou saidst in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit upon the mount of congregation in the uttermost parts of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. There are the six eyes of selfishness. And he wants to sit in the north. That's where the throne of God is. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11, 14. 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, the nations. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. So where's the devil? Here. And his nations? Down here. He's in control down here. God is in ultimate control, but permits him his venture with sin. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority, Revelation 13, 2. So the dragon is using a system, we've identified it, Roman Catholicism, to work through. The Pope has power to change laws, to abrogate laws, to dispense with all things, precepts of Christ. He is the one who changes God's law, has his own mark of authority, which is the, his Sabbath, and church and state work together to enforce papal systems, and they're actually dragon systems. So Jesus Christ is replaced by a system on this earth, and the Bible says that Protestantism will create an image unto the beast, and will also eventually have church and state do exactly the same thing through a holy alliance and causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, Revelation 13, 16 to 17. We've dealt with this issue, how it's going to go about. Ezekiel 20, 12 and 20, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me, me and you, and know that I am the Lord your God. Hearken unto me, that you know righteousness, the people in whose hearts is my law, fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be afraid of their revilings. Nothing's changed. What happened then, happens at the end. Whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. Either we're fully with God, or we're not with Him. That's the point. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder, now if thou commit no adultery, yet thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law, so speak, and so you do, as you shall be judged by the law of liberty. So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Just a little summary, just to bring us back up to speed. Acts tells us he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, by the man whom he has ordained, that's Jesus, and he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. No question about who that is. Ecclesiastes says in 3.17, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. There will be a judgment, the righteous and the wicked. Now where does judgment begin? Judgment begins with the people of God. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? 1 Peter 4.17 If you've had much light, you'll have to give an account. You'll have to give an account. When we are judged... God reveals our character to us and chastens us that we might be refined. You now people have this notion, oh my judgment is up, boom. Does he qualify, does he not qualify? No, he was bad, boom, boom, gone. No, God doesn't work like that. 
When you become a Christian, when you come to Christ, you come under judgment. So this judgment can be a good thing for the Christian. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. If you are in Christ, He starts chastening you that we might not be condemned with the world. Isn't that a good thing? So you become a Christian, you accept Jesus Christ, but you must be willing to what? Change. And what if you are not willing to change? Without sanctification, you will not see God. You might say, I want to become a Christian, I accept Jesus Christ, now I've become a Christian. Hello? Now the Lord says, change. And you say, no, I'm saved now. I don't have to change. Will you, will you make it or not? No. When you come into this judgment, God shows you your character and you have to change. And as I've explained before, he uses those we love and he uses those in the church to help us change. The three angels' messages goes out into the world. The first angel's message, you remember that? The everlasting gospel, the hour of the judgment has come. The second angel's message, Bab Babylon has fallen. The third angel, mark of the beast. That's the warning, last warning on earth. And after these things, what comes then? Revelation 18, 1 to 4, we've seen it. Babylon has fallen, she's become an unclean, Haven for demons. The church is no longer preaching what it should. And uh, all that become involved with her, the kings and the merchants, they will have to face the consequences. Revelation 16, 13 and 14, the unclean spirits like frogs go out into the world and they gather everyone for this mighty battle, these spirits of devils working miracles which go to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them for this great battle of God Almighty. And we've seen that we need patience and cling to obedience to God and faith of Jesus. Then the decree goes out, he that is unjust, remain unjust, he that is filthy, remain, un remain filthy, probation comes to a close. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, Daniel 12, 1. So that's the sequence. You see how it's going to happen? The last message goes out. Do not accept the mark of the beast, which will be enforced. People will be forced to keep the papal Sabbath and papal laws. And if they don't go along with that, if they keep to the biblical ones, just like Pharaoh, there will be a decree. You may not rest. No Shabbat. God's answer, plagues. A time of trouble such as not was since there was a nation. And then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. So now comes retribution. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. Revelation 15, 1. Now the first plague, hits the earth, the second one hits the sea, the third one, the fountains and the rivers, and the fourth one, the sun. And the earth is scorched, the sea and the fountains turn to blood, and we've had parallels when we had the trumpets. Remember that? But they were a third. This is now a final retributive series of plagues that strike the earth that will keep these antagonists of God very busy and in great trouble. The fifth plague hits the throne of the beast. That is, Catholicism itself will come under the condemnation of a whole plague. The sixth plague, the Euphrates. The Euphrates is the river that fed Babylon. Now if waters are peoples and nations and multitudes, the multitudes that fed Babylon will dry up. Babylon will stand exposed. And then comes an earthquake and hail is poured up into the air. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air 
And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Revelation 16, 17. So after the plagues, then comes this final destruction in the last plague. But during those plagues there shall no evil befall thee, neither any plague come near thy dwelling. Psalms 91, 10. And Isaiah says in chapter 26, 20 and 21, Come my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyselves, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. So God will make it possible for God's people to escape these terrible things. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. There will be a resurrection. So prior to the coming of the Lord, God's people are protected from the plagues and they are hidden. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So there's a falling away. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Well, we did that. We showed how he changed the laws and all those things. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We've seen all these things taking place. Two Thessalonians, and now you know what is restraining. We dealt with that. That he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work in Paul's time already. So is the Antichrist going to come in the future or was he busy already in the past? He was busy already in the past. And he who now restrains, and we showed that that was the Roman Empire, will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. And what's going to happen to him? Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So this Antichrist obviously arose then ruled, and will eventually be destroyed when? When Christ comes. The coming of the lawless one is according to the work of Satan, with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of truth that they might be saved. Did God give them an opportunity to find out the truth? Yes or no? Over and over and over. The Reformation, the last message, Remember, we went through these texts. He who now hinders, hinders until he is taken away. What obstacle was there but the Roman state? That's what we discussed in detail in that lecture. So Rome hindered, then the Antichrist comes. What does that do to the doctrine of futurism? Destroys it. What does that do to the doctrine of preterism that the Antichrist came out of Greece? Destroys it. Why? Because Paul clearly says that this is still going to happen. If Paul had known that Antiochus Epiphanes was the Antichrist, then he would have said, don't worry about it, he's gone. And then he says this, he's going to come still. So preterism is not an option, it's a lie. Futurism is also not an option, because the Antichrist arises then already and grows and will be destroyed eventually when Christ comes. Is that clear to everyone? Here, yeah, John Christom said the same, remember? When the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then Antichrist shall come. And so Irenaeus, Jerome, while the Caesars held imperial power, it was impossible for the predicted Antichrist to come. On the fall of the Caesars, he would arise. And so we see that what the world teaches is not biblical. Say to them that are of fearful heart, be strong, fear not, Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God, with a recompense, he will come and save you. Isaiah 35, 4. Now, think about this. If Jerusalem is to be built, rebuilt here on earth, and the Jews are supposed to replenish everything, then why doesn't it say your God will come with recompense and re 
instate you as the ruling nation. No, no, no. He's going to come and save those that are his, and the rest are all going to be destroyed. For the Lord thy God will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Isaiah 41, 13. So the coming of the Lord is to reap the harvest of the souls. So Revelation's central theme, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, is what the first coming is all about. And we saw that it will be a visible one, as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his work. And marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John 5, 28, 9. Two resurrections separated by a thousand years. We're just doing a quick summary here. So there's a resurrection of life and there's a resurrection of damnation. That's biblical teaching. Now, the resurrection of life. Let's just go through it again. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So that's the first resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 13. He saves us. The eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears and the death shall be unstopped. There's a total change. Then shall the lame man leap as a harp. The tongue of the dumb sing. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. The Lord himself shall descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, trump of God, dead in Christ, right first. And we shall be changed, for the corruptible must put on incorruption, and the mortal must put on immortality. That's what happens at the coming of Christ. Then we which are alive, remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we dealt with that in that whole lecture. All the details. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 We didn't answer all the questions. We're going to answer them now. What else has to transpire? So at the first coming, or the, well, the second coming of Christ, at his coming in glory, the righteous go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. Remember what happens to the wicked? Great day of wrath is come, who will be able to stand? Revelation 16, 7. They hid themselves in the dens, the mountains, the rocks, and they said, Fall on us, the wrath of the Lamb has come, and the Lord will execute kings in that day, and he'll fill the places with dead bodies. That's what the Bible says. Psalms 110, 5 and 6. Now here's the answer of the Lord to the eye of Satan. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee. I will destroy thy chariots, thy military, if you like. I will cut off the cities of the land and throw down all thy strongholds. I will cut off witchcraft out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images also I will cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the works of thy hands, and I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so I will destroy thy cities, I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen such as they have not heard. Micah 5, 10 to 15. How many eyes there? Eight. The number of Christ. Wow. Beautiful little parallels in the Bible. So Christ is coming to put an end to Satan's kingdom on this earth. Is that biblical, yes or no? Okay. So the wicked living are slain at the coming of Christ. And what happens to this planet and what happens to Satan? That's a good question. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Revelation 20, 1 and 2. So Satan is now going to be bound for how long? 
thousand years. How is he bound? Literal chains? No, he's bound by chains of circumstances for a thousand years. Psalm 68, 6. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. You see, there are chains of, chains of circumstance. Why is Satan bound for a thousand years by the circumstances he's in? There's nobody around in order for him to deceive them. There's nothing for him to do. But he's limited to this planet. He's going to stay here a thousand years with nothing on the planet. He can rest from his labors for a thousand years. Interesting. That's the millennium. Mili anos, one thousand years. Remember Jeremiah 4, 26? I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So how many cities left on this planet? None. Desolate cities. Destroyed. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day. When the Bible says that day, it means the coming of the Lord. From one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, they shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be done upon the ground. We read this text. They're all dead. So at the second coming of Christ, Jesus returns. The righteous living ascend. The righteous dead are resurrected. The wicked living are slain. How do they go to the Lord? With the clouds, with the angels. Where do they meet him? In the air. That's biblical. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation 20 verse 5. So, between the first resurrection and the second re resurrection, 1,000 years. Nothing happening on this planet. So, our day. Jesus returns. Earth desolate. Satan is bound. Abusos, without form and void. Genesis 1 2. The earth returns to Abusos state. Formless, void, destroyed. And there it lingers with only demons to occupy it. The earth, in a torn up, darkened condition, is the bottomless pit where Satan will be forced to stay during a thousand years. And he can look at all those dead bodies and he has no power. Because he is not capable of resurrecting them. So what about the righteous during the millennium? What happens now in the millennium? Well, let's read about it. Revelation 20, verse 6. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Where will that be? Must be in heaven, right? Must be in heaven. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Revelation 20, verse 4. Okay, I have a question. If Jesus is coming with the clouds of heaven, and he severs the righteous from the unrighteous, if all judgment has been given unto Jesus, then that judgment has already taken place, right? So what judgment is now given to the saints? Here they are, they all have thrones and judgment is given to them and they can look into the books. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? Wow. That means, which angels? The fallen angels. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. So, Satan will be judged. The judgment reveals that God has done everything he can to save every individual. Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Revelation 16, 7. I call this the judgment of verification. God has judged the world. Jesus returns. He severs the wicked from the just. The righteous go with him to heaven. He has prepared a place for them. I go to and I will come to take you where I am also. He takes them to heaven. 
And now they have an opportunity to see whether God was just. And they can go through the books and check out every single individual that has ever lived and the whole catastrophe of sin from its inception to its end. And if you have a question, where is so-and-so? That was such a good person. Or why is this one here? What's he doing there? Wow! <laughs> then you have an opportunity to look in the box. And what will the box reveal? That God was just and fair in all his dealings. And we can look through the entire process of sin. Every individual. Wow! Imagine 6,000 years of history. That's going to be quite something. That's going to be a long process. And while we are there, we can grow in knowledge and wisdom and be totally transformed over a thousand year period into that which God had intended for us to be. We will be instantly changed when we come. But imagine what we will learn in heaven. How many questions will we have? Unbelievable number of questions. And God will answer them personally. And we can check it out. And we will say, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. So during the millennium, the righteous are in heaven, the earth is desolate, Satan is bound, and the judgment of verification takes place in heaven. The judgment that Jesus has executed is given to the saints to verify. Check it out. See if my judgment was fair. That's pretty neat. I like that. Now remember that the Bible speaks of four comings of Christ. As a babe, we've dealt with that. To the ancient of days, that was, in a, that was a heavenly coming. In glory, the second coming, where there's a resurrection of the righteous. And then to restore the earth and set up the kingdom. There's no kingdom here yet. They are up there in heaven and they are ruling. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation 25. Who is the only one who is the resurrection and the life? Christ. So who has to resurrect them? Christ has to resurrect them. Obviously. That means that he has to come back to this earth to resurrect them, right or wrong. Okay. Let's have a look at this. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. Revelation 27 and 8. Where do these nations now come from? What happens after the thousand years? It said, the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were over. That means after the thousand years there must be a what? A resurrection. And all of a sudden here are these billions of people from all kinds of nations. And Satan looks at them and says, wow, I've got my team back. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? All right. So out he goes and he deceives them again. How does he deceive them? He probably tells them, I resurrected you. I resurrected you. So there's a resurrection of damnation. Zechariah 14, 3 and 4. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now, there's another war coming. Another war. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and a half of the mountain shall remove towards the north, and a half of it towards the south. Zechariah 14, 3 and 4. Which Jerusalem is this? Is it the old Jerusalem down here? Weren't, weren't all the cities destroyed? So where does this Jerusalem come from? And the Lord now is not staying in the air so that the others meet him. What is he doing? He comes down. And as he, the sinless one, touches this defiled earth, what happens? A mighty plain is opened up and cleansed. For what? For something to come down. 
And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21.2. All right, are we talking about this old Jerusalem here or this new Jerusalem? Now, where does this one come from? This is the greatest spaceship that will ever come to earth. A whole city. Huge. Nobody can even imagine it. Wow. A huge city. And God comes, and He comes down onto the earth, and woof! And then woof! City comes down. Who's in the city? God's people. God's people. Where were they for the last thousand years? In heaven. So now you have two groups in, on earth. The new Jerusalem has come down to earth. My hope is not in the old Jerusalem. My hope is in the new Jerusalem. My hope is not in an old Jerusalem down here on earth. My hope is in a new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven that God himself has built. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come and take you to myself so that you may be where I am also. Isn't that what he said? So who built the new Jerusalem? God built the new Jerusalem. Jesus built it. And in the new Jerusalem, everybody has a place. So you have a city dwelling. Do you realize that? With streets of gold. City dwelling with the streets of gold. Prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. This is something unbelievable. A whole city coming down with streets of gold. So after Satan is bound, the holy city descends. What happens then? Well, there's, of course, a resurrection. Revelation 20, verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison. Now, there's one thing you must remember again. The last arm of Revelation is a chiasm. The events are written in reverse to meet in the middle the great climax of the book of Revelation. So the events are described in reverse. Of course, it reads uh, one after the other. When the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed from his prison. There's a second resurrection. All the wicked are there again. He has Napoleon by his side. Adolf Hitler is over there. They're all ready to go. And shall go out to deceive the nations, which are on the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. Okay, interesting. To gather them together to a battle, the number of whom is as the sands of the sea. He has a huge army. And he sees the new Jerusalem, which if you take the size of it, is approximately an area the size of Poland. In fact, when I gave lectures in Poland, they said, Poland will be the place because it's exactly the size of the new Jerusalem. Of course, the city is as high as it is wide. What exactly the city will look like, I don't know. You can imagine it, maybe. A city that is as high as it is wide, as it is long. It could be a cube. What else could it be? It could also be a pyramid, couldn't it? I don't know which it's going to be. I haven't seen the New Jerusalem. I can't wait to see it. But I know that Satan loves pyramids and he is a copycat. So maybe it's a pyramid. It's just a thought. You know, it's not a doctrine. It's just a thought. I don't know what it's going to look like. I'm going to be excited to see what it looks like. Gog and Magog. Now there's a whole chapter in the book of Ezekiel regarding Gog and Magog and it is a typology of the destruction of Satan and his host. That's what it is. To gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city. Which city? The New Jerusalem, with the saints in it. And outside the city, on an earth that is still defiled, what is being cleansed by G Jesus coming down and touching? A great plain, on which is now the city. So they camp about the city, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. They're going to be destroyed. There's going to be another battle called Gog and Magog. 
and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So finally, which part of Babylon gets its deal? The dragon. The demonic host. Where, where the beast and the false prophet, the R is cursive. See? It's cursive. That means it's not in the original. It's very interesting. Where the beast and the false prophet, that just tells us where they were cast before. They've been destroyed once already. But they're all standing there now again because they're part of the second resurrection. But now the whole lot of them are going to be destroyed and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So now there's going to be a burning hell forever and ever? Well, we'll have to figure that one out. Jesus comes and there is a harvest. Revelation 20, 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So, when this throne arises, mighty things happen. And I saw the dead. Now remember, we're reading the events backwards because of the chiasm. So actually, when you read the story in Revelation, there's a war, a holy city is surrounded, and then there is a resurrection. Remember I told you you must read it backwards? The chiasm tells us we must actually read it. A resurrection, the people in hordes surround the city, a judgment, a destruction. So, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So each one is confronted exactly with why he didn't make it. And the sea gave up the dead which were in the dead, and hell delivered up the dead. See, we're reading the events backwards. So actually there's first the resurrection, then there is the judgment, and then there is the war and the destruction. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered, hell means hades, the grave, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Ah, we have a clue. The lake of fire is the second death. Now what happened at the first death? They died. What will happen at the second death? They die. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Good. Isaiah 45, 22. Let's look at this judgment. Look unto me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear, so those people who oppose God, what will they have to do? They will have to confess that he is king and that they were wrong. Every one of them. Every tongue shall swear, surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. That day is going to come. Romans 14, 11, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. The wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They are brought forth to the day of wrath. Job 21.3 They're going to be destroyed. This battle of Gog and Magog, when does this take place? So the battle of Gog and Magog is a totally different battle to the battle of Armageddon. Two battles. Armageddon takes place when? At the second coming of Christ. Gog and Magog takes place after the millennium. Gog and Magog means concealed, means hidden, mystery, if you like. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, Revelation 29. So the wicked are judged, they're raised, they're judged, and Satan looks at the hosts that he has surrounded him, and he gathers a little bit of strength and he says, let's go for it. Let's go for it. And what happens? Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation 22, 9. They are destroyed in fire. How long does this fire burn? 
Fire rains down from heaven. Psalms 37, 20, into smoke they shall consume away. The fire shall devour them. Psalms 21, verse 9. There's perfect harmony in the Bible. You can go through it. This is the second death, Revelation 20, 14. Why does God do this? Well, firstly, they'll have to give an account for what they have done in their lives. Secondly, they will have to acknowledge that God loved them that are there in the city because they often persecuted them, they burnt them, they crushed their heads against the rocks, they had the inquisitions, they slaughtered them relentlessly, they will have to acknowledge that God loved them. And there's one other thing. What about that one that you think should have made it? The judgment reveals that he shouldn't have made it. But you think, well, if only, if only, if only he could have seen or she could have seen, maybe they wouldn't have been so antagonistic towards God. But when they are resurrected, you'll see that same animosity and hatred in that face as in all the other faces. And you will realize once and for all, wow, God knows what he's doing. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Matthew 25, 46. Now we have to deal with the doctrine of everlasting punishment. Is God going to burn them forever and ever? Then how do you explain that they consume away? What does it mean in the Hebrew mindset, everlasting punishment? Let's go to Revelation 14, 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. What does this mean? Forever and ever. Let's have a look at parallelism. Psalms 92 verse 7. When the wicked spring up, spring as the grass and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. So the Bible has to be in harmony with itself. So they will be destroyed forever. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. There will come a recompense. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become a burning pitch. It shall not be quenched Night nor day, the smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Isaiah 34, 8 to 10. Is there a contradiction? Well, let's go to Jude 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? No. So what has happened is, the fire has burnt until Sodom and Gomorrah is what? Gone. And the consequences are how long? Eternal. Go to Peter, 2 Peter 2.6. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should live in ungodly. So here's a type. When these cities were burnt, the consequences are forever. Well, that's maybe not enough for most people. So let's go into this unquenchable fire. Jeremiah might give us a clue. Jeremiah 17, 27. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. There's an unquenchable fire. This fire will be set alight, and it shall not be quenched. There's a typology of an unquenchable fire. 
Go to Jeremiah 52, 12 to 13. Now in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar. Saran, captain of the guard, who served the king of Babylon into Jerusalem and burnt the house of the Lord. There it was set on fire. And the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and all the houses of the great men burned he with fire. So this unquenchable fire was set in motion. 2 Chronicles 36, 19 to 21 takes this analogy and says, And they burnt the house of God just explaining what happened. And broke down the walls of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the godly vessels, the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. To what? To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. So in other words, when Jeremiah said, it's going to be burning with unquenchable fire. Here it says it was fulfilled when they burnt the house of God. Correct or not? Is that fire still burning? No. The consequences thereof? How long? Eternal. Until the land had enjoyed a Sabbath, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept the Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. So Malachi 4.1 for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, unquenchable fire. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Malachi 4, verse 1. Malachi 4 verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, they shall be what under your soles of your feet? Ashes. So, is there an everlasting hell on this planet, yes or no? No. No. Would that be in accordance with the character of God? No. So, imagine this. When I was a Roman Catholic and they told me that my mother was going to burn in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because she wasn't a Catholic, it turned me off God completely. Now I see that there will be a fire, yes. Unquenchable until it has completed what? It's burning. And the consequences will be for how long? Forever and ever. There will be ashes under your feet. And there will be tears, yes. I don't believe tears are over until everything has been restored. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. 2 Peter 2.9 Would I be happy, let's say my mother didn't make it. I believe God is going to judge her by the light that she has and I have every hope of seeing her in the kingdom of God. But let's say she doesn't make it. And let's say I do make it. Would I be happy if I saw her burning in hell forever and ever? And would it be fair of God to burn someone forever and ever and ever for a life of 80 years of apostasy? Yes or no? No, it's a, it is a horrendous doctrine. It is, a, it is a disgrace to the character of God. It's a Roman Catholic doctrine. It's a pagan doctrine. It's not a biblical doctrine. But it can be read if you distort the texts and you do not take the parallelisms that are in the Bible. What happens to Satan? I will destroy thee, O covering cherub. Therefore I will bring forth a fire in the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth. Ezekiel 28, 16 and 18. What happens to the devil and his angels? going to be destroyed. For how long? Forever. So the sin question will be dealt with forever and ever and ever. He's going to be gone. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God, and they shall see his face. Revelation 23, 22, 4. God is going to set up a kingdom here on this earth. Now, all that's happened up until now 
is the holy city has come down. There's been a resurrection. There's been a judgment. All the wicked of all the ages, plus all the demons, plus Satan himself, are dead. Satan is going to die eternal death. And every wicked one with him. And then, God will step out and the people follow him and they will walk on the ashes of the dead. The earth will be burnt up, will be made new. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Revelation 21.1 Isn't this totally different to a Jerusalem and a millennium of peace? It doesn't make any sense, that doctrine anymore. So a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Revelation 21.1 Nevertheless, we according to the promise look for a new heaven and a new earth. Not an old earth, dollied up. No, a new earth. Wherein dwelleth righteousness, 2 Peter 3.13. So after the millennium, God will recreate the heavens and the earth. Well, the heavens could be the atmosphere. That's pretty polluted. It needs some cleansing. At the end of the millennium, the holy city descends. Satan attacks. The wicked are destroyed. The earth is made new. That's the biblical doctrine. Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. You see, the sea had separated. The sea is salty. And there's a whole host of geology in that. I'm not going to deal with that right now. But there will be water, huge inland lakes, as big as oceans probably. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but it's going to be fantastic, and it will be fresh water. And it's going to look 10 billion times better than that. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Isaiah 11, 6, 9. The lion shall eat what? Straw like the ox. That's amazing. And the bear and the cow shall graze together. Amazing. If you look at the original diet of the animals in the world, you will see that the plants of the, of the earth were created for them as food. After sin and death came in, the animal kingdom changed. Some of them became carnivores, some of them became herbivores, some, of, well, some stayed herbivore, others became scavengers. That's a long series of things that happened. There's a whole lecture coming up on the video series on that restoration from a scientific perspective. It's very interesting what will happen then. But there will no, be no more death. And young people, we can go up and pat a lion and do whatever they like. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. Isaiah 65, 23. Where will the kingdom be? Here. On this earth. After the millennium. No wicked whatsoever, no animal that kills, nothing like that anymore. For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Isaiah 65, 17. There's going to be a total change on this planet. And listen to this. They shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Mine elect shall long enjoy the works of their hands. How long? Forever. Okay, so let me sum this up. You will have a city dwelling in the new Jerusalem. Who built it? God. God is going to build you a house. Jesus Christ builds you a house. Wow. And you're going to have a what dwelling? A country dwelling. Who's going to build it? 
you can build it just like you want it. You can go to the greatest architect this universe has ever known and say, what would you suggest? <laughs> and you can build it just like you want to. What else are you going to do there? You're going to plant what? You're going to plant orchards. And what are you going to do? You're going to eat them. Now, I have been in so many houses in the last few years, and everywhere I go, I plant these stupid fruit trees. Boom. And then before I get to eat them, what happens? I move. I hate it with a passion. And when I drive past these houses where I used to live and I see this beautiful tree, it freaks me out. Because I cannot even take one of those fruits without being a thief. Isn't that right? What a pathetic situation. Here, I will have a home in the country, I will plant my own things, and I can eat them. Now, just think of that Israelite system. Wow! What if I go for a walk on the planet? And I'm passing your ground, and your ground, and your ground. May I eat? Absolutely. What was the biblical law? What was the typology law on the old planet? When you pass through someone else's land, you may eat as much as you like, but you may not what? You may not harvest. You may not harvest. So, will there be any fences? No? No more fences. And I can pass through your land without you freaking out because you will love me and I will love you. And I can see a fruit there and I can decide, which one am I going to look? This one looks absolutely perfect, and that one looks absolutely perfect. So which of the absolutely perfect ones do I feel like eating? It wouldn't bug you at all. And I would take one, and I would eat it. And I would come up against all these animals. Animals that we haven't even seen. There are so many extinct animals. Can you imagine it? And we go for a walk and we go into that rainforest and we go and look at all these creatures and what have you and we ride on these elephants that are huge or maybe even much huger animals than that. And we travel through and we look at all these things. And if I have to gather to the New Jerusalem, how quickly can I be there? Speed of light? No, that's much too slow. How quickly? Speed of thoughts. How quickly did an angel come to Daniel when he was praying? Before you even asked, he was there. All right? Philip was next to the chariot. There's a typology. And he was preaching to the eunuch. And in the next moment, he was in a city hundreds of miles away. How quickly did it go? Like that. So will there be any more separation? You say to your family, I'm going to Andromeda today. <laughs> it's 40 zillion. billion zillion miles away. Well, have a nice day. <laughs> Off you go. And then the question comes, uh, are you the home for lunch? Would you like me to be home for lunch? Absolutely. All right. <coughs> Hello, I'm here for lunch. That'll be fantastic. No more speed boundaries, none of these things anymore. I will eat the fruit that I have planted. I will plant my vineyards. Each one will have his place in the country. And believe you me, if I took the entire population of the world today, did you know that they would fit into just the northern part of Florida? Did you know that? The entire world population today would fit into that tiny little spot. So we're not really overpopulated. It's just the earth is in such a mess. Imagine if the whole earth is restored. Will everybody have enough space? Even if you calculate from the beginning, all through the ages, there will be ample space. And the, the New Jerusalem, by the way, if you calculate the amount of space in that, there will be enough space to accommodate any, everyone who has ever lived. 
So God really doesn't want anyone to be lost. He's not going to make the New Jerusalem small, thinking only of those that will be there. The New Jerusalem will be big enough for everyone that has ever lived. Unfortunately, angels will have to occupy some space. It's very sad, because it depends on our choice. But this new world is something else. No death, no pain, no nothing. It will be fantastic. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. You know something else? The Bible says that the redeemed are those that follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. Doesn't it say that? All right. Is God nailed down? Or is he mobile? He's mobile. He has a whole universe out there. Do you think it's there for twinkling? What do you think is in that universe? There will be huge numbers, zillions of worlds out there, all under his control, unfallen. And as the king of the universe, where will he go? Everywhere. And who gets to go along? We do. We are representatives of the Most High telling people or whatever created beings out there what Christ has done for us. Telling them about his beautiful character. Telling them about all the wonderful things that Jesus has done in our lives. And what it was like to be sinful and lost and to be redeemed. And sin will never raise its head again. Guaranteed. And the redeemed will stand as a bastion and a reproof to sin forever and ever and ever. They will not hurt nor destroy ever in God's kingdom ever again. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 8, 11. It's a beautiful doctrine. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another... And from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. Isaiah 66, 23. I thought the new moon festivals were done away with. Weren't they part of the ceremonial law? Why do we come together every new moon? Is there a new new moon festival? And what other day do we come together? Every Sabbath. So once a week, we will go to the holy city. And we won't trample on each other's toes. You'll all have your own dwelling. And we go to worship the Lord. Now what happens on the monthly feast? Well, I'm not absolutely sure what happens in the monthly feast, but I can guess. It says there is a tree of life in the holy city, and it bears its fruits, how often? Once a month. Once a month. And it has how many different kinds of fruits? Twelve. So you even get a choice. You don't like that one, you can have that one, right? Individuality, freedom of choice. I like that one. And the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Why that? Maybe there's a substance in the leaves which ensures perfect DNA function forever. Maybe there's a DNA restorer. I don't know what we're going to do with the leaves. Maybe we make tea from them. Maybe they taste better than chocolate. I don't know. But the leaves are obviously edible and delightful. Plus the fruit is delightful. And it is a huge tree. The Bible describes it as standing on both sides of the river, which is Eden, because Eden has been incorporated in the New Jerusalem. Wow. So once a month, we come together in a feast to celebrate eternity at the Tree of Life. And once a week, we come together to sing praises to our Heavenly King. I cannot wait to be in heaven. I cannot wait for the new Jerusalem. I cannot wait for the kingdom of God. And I hope that all of you will be part of that kingdom too.